thank you to everyone who have joined us today. Um, I welcome you on behalf of the University of Sydney Institute for Infectious Diseases or Sydney ID and uh, the School of Public Health. We acknowledge the, the traditional custodianship of the various lands on which we meet today um, and pay our respects to those who have cared and continue to care for country. Uh, this is the second talk in our distinguished lecture series and we are very grateful to introduce Professor Ben Cowling. Um, ben heads the Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics in the School of Public Health at Hong Kong University and co-directs the WHO Collaborating Center for Infectious Disease Epidemiology. He's a world expert on the epidemiology of influenza and has been closely involved um, in some of the first reports from China about the impact and spread of COVID-19. We cannot ask for anyone better placed to critically reflect on COVID-19 and influenza, differences, similarities, and lessons learned. Ben, over to you. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to speak today in your Distinguished Lecture series. I'm speaking from Hong Kong, where we uh, have just passed about six months uh, of time without any local COVID outbreak. Uh, we've had a couple of scares, but, but no local uh, outbreaks. And so that's, uh, that's an exciting time for us in Hong Kong to be able to stay clear of COVID. But at the same time, we're also thinking ahead about uh, what's going to happen next. Are we, are we going to be uh, doing this for, for some time? So we can talk about that maybe later. My talk today is going to focus on uh, pandemic influenza responses and, and, and COVID responses. I'm going to spend some time talking about things that I think we, we've known are unknowns. So that's known unknowns since 2009, since the influenza pandemic in 2009, and maybe uh, uh, having a better handle on now. Um, and then I'm gonna talk at the end about maybe some ideas for, for influenza research that are stimulated by, by observations in the COVID pandemic. Uh, so it's quite a, a few different things to talk about. And uh, I'll, I'll try and speak slowly so that you can follow because um, it is quite a, a, a lot of different things that I'm going to cover. Just give a very brief overview of, of these three uh, on, on this table, the three pathogens that I've, uh, that I've worked on in my time in Hong Kong. I first came to Hong Kong in 2004 uh, as part of the response to the SARS epidemic, where in Hong Kong we had uh, 1,755 cases, 300 deaths. It had a massive impact on the city. Um, and uh, in Hong Kong, the government decided very proactively that we needed to be better at handling infectious diseases, better at responding to them, and have research capacity locally so we could understand better what's happening. And so I came in 2004. I worked on influenza for many, many years and still do. And then in the last two years, I've been working on, on COVID-19. So there's some, some similarities between uh, the SARS coronavirus and, and the, the SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19. But I think a lot of differences, and in my mind, COVID is more similar to influenza than it is to SARS. The transmissibility of COVID, though, is much greater than of influenza, and particularly now the Delta variant is really, really very transmissible, much more transmissible than flu viruses, much more transmissible than the original COVID-19 uh, virus, the original SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it's posing massive challenges around the world. Uh, the severity of, of COVID is also more in the ballpark of influenza, particularly after vaccination, than it, is, uh, than it is of SARS. And with SARS, we saw most cases being uh, having severe clinical presentation, whereas for influenza and COVID-19, actually most cases are very mild. We know it's only a small minority of cases that are severe. Uh, less than 5% require hospitalization. And uh, prior to vaccination, case fatality rate, infection fatality rate, perhaps half a percent um, and after vaccination with a high vaccine effectiveness against severe disease is probably gone down by a factor of 10. I would say those are still uncertain. I put a lot of question marks on this slide because I think there's still quite a bit of uncertainty about a lot of these quantities. Uh, even for influenza, I would say we, we don't fully understand the, the infection fatality rate, but, but a, a common estimate would be somewhere around or just below 0.1%. Uh, and that's because in, in Hong Kong, for example, we think we have about a million flu, epi uh, sorry, about a million flu infections in a typical flu season in a typical year and uh, about a, a thousand excess deaths. And so some of those are not immediate 
uh, deaths from influenza pneumonia, but uh, ultimately deaths that are caused by the influenza infections. Um, in terms of the key groups for transmission, I think we, we were fascinated with COVID-19 that it didn't seem to spread well in children in the first year, but now with the Delta uh, variant, it, it really seems like young adults and also teenagers are important in transmission. And that's more like influenza where we know it's, it's the particularly school-aged children that are responsible for a lot of the spread. Uh, and that's very different to SARS in 2003, where it was really nosocomial outbreaks uh, that, that drove the, those epidemics and strict infection control in hospitals was really the, the most critical measure to control SARS. It wasn't the, so much the community-based measures, the masking, other things that happened in Hong Kong. I think it was really the, the identification of cases and the strict isolation and, uh, and, and all the associated targeted infection control measures that, that really let us control SARS. Uh, for for COVID-19, I still have a question, what are the most efficient control measures? And I'm gonna get into that in a bit. In 2019, I worked with the World Health Organization to, to help them to update their pandemic influenza guidelines. It's like a playbook. In a sports team, you have like a list of things that you're gonna do, it's called a playbook. And for pandemic influenza, we have a playbook of what are the kind of measures that, that governments could consider doing in order to, to mitigate an influenza pandemic. We put this figure in, in near the beginning of that, that uh, document for the World Health Organization is the concept of flattening the curve uh, for an influenza pandemic or influenza epidemic. And if we don't do anything, we imagine that the curve in green might happen and that's bad news. If we take some public health measures, if we do something, we'll hopefully be able to flatten out the curve to spread cases over a longer time period to reduce the height of the peak and that's important for healthcare capacity, maybe to delay it, to buy time, um, to, to, to have a, a better response, and maybe even to buy time until vaccines are available or antiviral drugs are available. And so that was the concept for mitigating pandemic influenza. But in COVID-19, I think we realized very quickly, I would say within the first month or two, that it, it, it's a different, it's a different uh, kind of pathogen. And maybe the, the the idea of flattening the curve is, is not going to be sufficient. And that's because I mark on the graph here uh, the health system capacity as it relates to a COVID epidemic. And we recognize that even if we flatten the curve, there'll still be a, a very substantial number of cases beyond healthcare system capacity. So even if we flatten the curve, even if we can, can increase healthcare system capacity, uh, get more ventilators, more intensive care beds, it's still going to have an enormous health impact beyond what we can cope with. And so flattening the curve may not be the, what we aim for. We may instead need to aim for, for stopping the curve effectively. So not having a curve at all, and then holding COVID at bay until we can come up with a, a more sustainable strategy, either with antiviral drugs to, to treat severe infections or with vaccines to prevent severe infections. And so that's why I said a couple of slides ago, I think maybe for COVID, if it's possible, then short, short term zero COVID may be the best kind of target uh, to hold that at bay until we, we've got a, a response that, uh, that's more sustainable. And if we look in the United States to show the difference between seasonal influenza and then COVID-19, uh, I'm, I'm used to looking at these figures in terms of the impact of influenza every year. If you look at the bottom left of this figure, the yellow bars are the impact of seasonal influenza every winter in the United States. And this 2017 to 2018 season was a big flu season. This was front page news in the United States. A lot of people in hospital, uh, a lot of excess mortality um, and some public health responses because of the, the impact of flu. Uh, but it's dwarfed, it's totally dwarfed by the impact of, of COVID-19 with mitigation measures, with very stringent and, and, and substantial mitigation measures in place, there's an enormously greater impact of COVID-19. And that's what I mentioned in, before about the, the, the substantially greater threat of COVID-19. One of the interesting consequences of, of the response to COVID, though, the, the very stringent measures that have been implemented is that influenza has almost disappeared for the last 18 months. Uh, it hasn't completely disappeared. 
But this is a, a figure showing that uh, in, in the United States, there's been almost no flu for the last 18 months. In Hong Kong, we've, I don't think we've had any flu or, or maybe just a handful of cases in quarantine, in, in, in the on-arrival quarantine in the last 18 months. And so what it tells us is that actually containment of influenza is possible. And so when, when we were working on the World Health Organization guidelines, I got them here on the, on, on the, the left-hand side. This is the guidelines that, that we, we came up with. When we worked on those guidelines, we had in mind that, that we have to plan mitigation, even in a really severe flu pandemic. And we reviewed a lot of the evidence base to see, to see what could be recommended and, and, and so on. And there really isn't a lot of evidence, actually, for, for hand hygiene and face masks for influenza. There's a bit of evidence, and I'll show that. Uh, a bit later in the talk. For other measures, there's really not a lot of evidence to go on to inform what should be done. So when we, we discussed with, with a lot of different uh, people um, what, what kind of measures could be recommended to governments in the event of a, of a flu pandemic or a flu epidemic, and it's very difficult to know what, what's feasible and, and so on uh, for mitigating flu. We had masks in there for everybody in a, in a, in a pandemic of, of high severity. And of course, for COVID, it's, a, it's a beyond the, what we imagined for influenza. I also have a lot of other measures, but uh, notably, we didn't recommend entry and exit screening and border closures. Uh, we didn't recommend quarantine of exposed individuals uh, or contact tracing. But those measures have been at the forefront of, of COVID responses in some, in some parts of the world, including Hong Kong and Australia. And I think maybe now, actually, we should go back. I should go back to these World Health Organization guidelines and maybe rethink the idea of containment. I think containment of pandemic influenza might be an option. It might not be an option that's chosen, but I think before we didn't even think it was an option. And now with the experience from COVID that we can contain influenza, we can stop flu from spreading. And a lot of these measures actually have been used where we we weren't sure whether or not they, they could be, whether they'd be permitted, whether they'd be feasible, whether they'd be acceptable. Uh, so it, it's fascinating to, to think that this is just two years ago that we, 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 we published these guidelines and uh, now we probably have to do them again. So I wanna spend a bit of time talking about some, some things that I think have been known unknowns since 2009. And I, I'm sure there's a lot. So I'm, I'm just talking about the things that, that I'm, particularly familiar with because of my own research in, in uh, influenza epidemiology and COVID epidemiology. Uh, and I've, I've got a slide on, on each of these. So I'll, I'll go through one by one. So firstly, I think aerosol transmission is really a, is still a very controversial topic. Um, I think maybe the, the way we've thought about it hasn't, hasn't always been been helpful. We, we've thought in terms of dichotomies that the viruses spread in this way or they spread in that way. Whereas in reality, of course, there's multiple modes of transmission. Uh, for sure, viruses can spread like, like COVID can spread through large droplets. But I think it's also become increasingly clear that aerosols do play a role in COVID transmission. What we haven't established is how much of a role but they clearly play a role. And to give a, a domestic example here in Hong Kong, we have quarantine hotels where people coming into the city uh, have to stay for 14 or 21 days in a hotel room, not allowed to leave. Uh, they've got to be inside that room for the 21 days. And we've seen a number of, of transmission events within these hotels from one room to another. And it must be aerosol transmission with virus carried through the air from one room to another, either uh, out of an open window down and into the, the, the room below, this happened, or along the corridor when doors are open or, or because of the airflow. And so that, that's a, a clear example where it has happened, but what we haven't established is what's the frequency and what's the importance. And so I, I've been, been, been working on aerosol transmission for, for many years, uh, published many articles. In the early days of COVID-19, I. I was uh, on some World Health Organization uh, teleconferences discussing this issue, and there's a lot of strong views on this. So uh, I, I think we have a better handle on it now, but I would say it's still, it's still something that we need to, to work more on. Uh, 
face masks has been another uh, controversial area. So in the, in the World Health Organization uh, guideline development process, we, we reviewed again the evidence on face masks. And the studies shown in this slide are randomized trials of face masks with or without hand hygiene. At the top is with hand hygiene, on the bottom is without a hand hygiene intervention. And so we, we looked at these randomized trials with confirmed influenza outcomes. And I think almost all of these studies were supported by the United States CDC as a pandemic preparedness uh, a program of research on non-pharmaceutical interventions. I think only the, the Australian studies by Rainer McIntyre and the German study by uh, Thorsten Seuss uh, were, were, were not. The others were, I think, maybe Barashid. So the, the, uh, there's been a lot of studies in, in particularly in the last 10 or 12 years on, on face masks. And really coming to the conclusion that face masks don't seem to have an enormous effect in reducing transmission in terms of a face mask intervention. And so whenever I talk about face masks, uh, that I, I generally create allergic reactions from two ends of the spectrum. So one end of the spectrum is, is, is maybe people who, who understand that masks can be really effective if they're worn properly. And if you or I uh, were walking into a room where there's, there's COVID patients, we should be wearing a mask rather than not wearing a mask because we understand that masks will protect us, not 100%, but they will protect us. And so seeing an estimate like maybe a 10% or 20% reduction doesn't seem like what we imagined it, the, 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 the kind of effectiveness that masks would have on an individual exposure basis. And on the other side of the spectrum is, is the people who will say maybe uh, because masks don't completely block transmission, that means they're not worth wearing at all. And I, I actually wrote a commentary uh, in, in Euro surveillance earlier this year saying, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Just because masks aren't 100% perfect doesn't mean they can do some good. Um, and I think it, it's very clear. I think we recognize that masks can have an effect, particularly at the community level. They can reduce transmission. They won't stop it completely, but that's still worth an effect worth having. And so in the World Health Organization guidelines, we made exactly this point, that uh, there's mechanistic evidence that masks will work. We certainly believe on an individual level, if you wear a mask, you'll be better protected than if you don't wear a mask. But at the community level, we can't expect enormous effect sizes. We can't expect enormous reductions. And I would also emphasize that, that mask mandates will have widely different impact on communities. If a lot of people are already wearing masks, and then a mask mandate is introduced is not going to make much difference because people are already wearing masks where they need to wear masks anyway. Um, and so I think we, there's been some research published on, on the impact of mask mandate specifically, but I, I tend to look more at uh, mask interventions and, and, and trying to estimate what's really the, the value of, of masks in the community, um, in the almost in the, in the, in the people that are, that are going to wear them, uh, because I think that that's really still a key uncertainty. For COVID-19, unfortunately, I think it's a missed opportunity that there have only been two, uh, to my knowledge, two randomized trials for face masks, um, at least two, two that are reported so far. One is the Dan mask trial that was published in Annals of Internal Medicine, um, but I think that was a, a, a disappointing trial from my perspective. I've been involved in a number of face mask trials. And in this particular study, I thought the sample size was insufficient. They powered their study to identify a 50% relative risk reduction in COVID-19 by, by sending out people, uh, boxes of masks to people. And I, I, I don't think that's a plausible effect size. I, I would have expected 10 to 20% as, as I showed in the previous slide. Um, and indeed that's what they found. But the other issue with the Dan mask trial is that they, they sent out the masks with a baseline test. And then one month later, they did a follow-up antibody test. And they used the antibody test uh, in their minds, I think, to see who got infected during that month of the intervention. But it, you and me may know that with antibodies, the antibodies don't appear until maybe three or four weeks after infection. So a lot of what they were measuring in that one month antibody test, which was their primary outcome and contributed the majority of events, what they identified was actually uh, 
some infections that have occurred before the intervention was even applied. And that's kind of frustrating to see that happen because um, that, that's an, an issue that could have been addressed in the study design, I think. The other study was, was a, a trial done in Bangladesh by some economists, a very large number of, of adults uh, in 600 villages cluster randomized to wear masks or not. And very strangely, the outcome was symptomatic seroprevalence. So as far as I can tell, when I read the preprint, what they did in those villages is if there were people that reported symptoms, they went to do an antibody test. And I don't know why they didn't do PCR, because if I knew there were people that were symptomatic in a village, I'd try and test for the virus to see if it was a COVID illness or, or not a COVID illness. But for some reason, they did symptomatic seroprevalence. Maybe it's easier logistically to, to send out the, the, the kits or whatever. And so they found a, an 11% relative reduction in symptomatic seroprevalence. But uh, the, the percentages of, of symptomatic seroprevalence are very low. And this is in a time where there was a lot of COVID in the community. And so I, I, I'm not sure what to make of that trial. And I think it's a missed opportunity uh, that, that mask trials haven't been done in the COVID pandemic. There's a lot of research published from observational studies, but is very, uh, in my opinion, very limited quality. An issue that was raised in, in 2009 with, the, with uh, influenza was whether asymptomatic transmission is important or not. And I, I put the abstract on the slide here because it's fascinating. It was a question that's been raised and never really addressed to my knowledge. Um, I've certainly looked at viral shedding in asymptomatic influenza cases. I've, I've, I've demonstrated that it does occur, but I'm not aware of any estimates for influenza of, of whether asymptomatic transmission is important. And I remember early in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, again, on, on, on teleconferences where the World Health Organization probably in, in early February, I explained that uh, we're seeing substantial asymptomatic transmission in China and with a, a, a diverse set of responses from other experts around the world, including some who, who couldn't imagine that asymptomatic transmission was possible. But uh, on the left, we, we publish in Nature Medicine uh, estimates that, that a substantial fraction of transmission occurs prior to symptom onset. I'm not sure it's really 50%, but a substantial fraction. And on the right hand side, uh, we showed in a science paper that the serial intervals, that's the time between consecutive generations of infection, declined substantially when, when the epidemic in Wuhan was being brought under control, uh, partly by very rapid detection of symptomatic cases and isolation of those cases. And so when you remove uh, the, the, the symptomatic cases and their almost transmission, what you're left with, what's left behind, is the pre-symptomatic transmission before you even knew that people were infected. And, and that's how we explained this, this very substantial reductions in serial intervals. But I, I think there's still open questions about, about how much of this is really going on. And then the, 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 the related question of asymptomatic cases that never develop symptoms, how contagious are they? I don't think we understand it. One of my particular research interests is repeat vaccination effects. Uh, so I'm, I'm studying people that get vaccinated every year. And on the left hand side is, a, is something we commonly see with the antibody levels. So someone who was vaccinated in the preceding year and then we vaccinate them again this year, they have a, a higher level of antibodies before vaccination than people who were not vaccinated last year because they've got this carryover of, of some antibodies from the last year, uh, more antibodies from the last year, I should say. But their response to the vaccine is weaker and then they end up with a, with a lower level of antibodies than the first time vaccinee or, or the person who was vaccinated this year, but not last year. And this uh, it's a fascinating phenomenon. I don't think we fully understand it, but uh, a number of reviews, including one that I was involved in, have shown that, that there are weaker responses in terms of effectiveness to uh, weak, weaker effectiveness in people who were vaccinated every single year. Uh, maybe some of it is because of uh, blunted responses or, or misdirected responses. And for COVID-19, I have a concern that this may, may start to be observed when vaccines are updated with new variants. Uh, that, for example, if, if you or I were to receive a, a Delta vaccine, a Delta booster, that our response would be partly directed back to the, the original virus that we were first vaccinated with. And uh, one of the things that confuses me still 
is, a, is, is about correlates of protection and how we interpret them. On the left is a, is a figure that I've only seen on Twitter. I haven't seen a publication with this antigenic map. It's from Kai Kuferschmidt, who's a, a journalist for science. And he posted this some time ago, uh, indicating that the Delta variant is quite antigenically similar to the Wuhan strain. And to me, it, it, if that's the case, I don't understand why vaccine effectiveness has dropped so substantially uh, against the Delta variant. Um, I wonder if there's more to the story. Maybe the antigenic map is, is not quite right, or maybe just with the antigenic information with the antibody levels is not capturing enough of the protection against infection. And, and although antibody titers are a correlate of protection, including antibody titers that we use in antigenic maps, it's not the full story, maybe, because uh, I, I think that to me, that's still a, a, a fascinating issue. All right, I'm, I'm getting towards the end of my talk. I have a few more slides. I just wanted to, to raise three ideas that I've been thinking about recently uh, because of, of experiences in the COVID pandemic. So the first one is super spreading. For COVID-19, it's very clear in, in Hong Kong and I think elsewhere that super spreading is an important phenomenon. And super spreading is the phenomenon where a minority of cases seem to be more contagious. And if we have a uh, a concurrence of a more contagious case, along with a lot of other susceptible people around them, maybe because they go to a bar, they go to a restaurant, they go to a, uh, a big family dinner, a wedding, whatever. If we have that confluence of circumstances, a highly contagious case and the, 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 the being surrounded by contagious people, uh, by, by susceptible people, we'll see super spreading events. And the other side of that, the flip side of the coin, is that many cases are actually not very contagious at all. And so on these cluster diagrams, I will be drawn to the upper part with these larger clusters of, of cases. And this is in Hong Kong where we, we do track down cases, we do isolate them, we quarantine their contacts, and the boxes around the circles are, are cases that have been picked up in quarantine because they've, they've been taken away to a quarantine facility and by the time they become contagious, the, the, there's no chance to spread it. And so the boxes are typically the terminal nodes, but there's many nodes that, that have terminated before quarantine. And in the lower panel, there's many cases that didn't really spread infection to anyone else or just one other person. We estimated 70% of cases in, in, our, in our second wave, particularly in Hong Kong, didn't transmit infection to anyone else. And I think that's fascinating. I want to ask the question, does something like that happen for influenza? It hasn't been studied. Is it that a minority of people are responsible for most transmission? In terms of viral shedding, I, I've shown that is the case, that a minority of people shed a, a lot of the virus, but uh, whether that corresponds to transmission or not, we don't know. Uh, second thing is with, with school-based measures for COVID, I think we recognize that for influenza, school closures can be a very efficient response if they're feasible because school-aged children spread a lot of flu and, uh, and school closures is a way that has been used in Hong Kong and elsewhere to control flu epidemics and flu pandemics. But with the experience from COVID where we've used school-based measures, in other words, schools stay open, but we do a whole lot of things to try to protect children in the classroom and in the school environment. We did that for COVID and it seemed to be effective before the Delta variant. This is when, when COVID didn't spread as well in children, but we had, uh, we, we reported in this article uh, 15 cases in children that we think did go to school when they were potentially contagious and there was no transmission. We attribute part of that maybe because children are not as contagious, but also part of that to the school-based measures. And I think there's a massive opportunity now to look at school-based measures for influenza, where prior to COVID, we maybe thought that there's not much we can do. Um, and then if it got to a really serious situation in a flu epidemic, we'll close schools. But now I think we can actually seriously look at some school-based measures for influenza, maybe for other respiratory infections. And the, the next step, in my opinion, is randomized trials of some of these kind of measures, uh, whatever type. And, and not a, not, I'm not talking about just from Hong Kong. I'm talking about anywhere in the world. I think it's really a, a good opportunity to look at school-based measures for infection control. And that, that could be a, a fantastic complement to, to uh, public health measures in, in the next flu season, in the next flu pandemic. And then the last thing, I'm coming, coming really close to the end now. Um, looking at 
antibody types in Hong Kong, we have two vaccines available for COVID. We have the, the Pfizer vaccine, which in Hong Kong is marketed by Fosun Pharma, not Pfizer. So we have the Pfizer vaccine, the mRNA vaccine, and we also have an inactivated vaccine from China, uh, from the company Sinovac. And so we can compare them directly because we have people in Hong Kong who are receiving one and some who are receiving the others. And we published some, some data. This is neutralizing antibody titus showing there's a massive difference, a tenfold difference after the second dose in uh, inactivated vaccines uh, compared to an mRNA vaccines. And so, I mean, that's interesting, interesting just in terms of the, the comparison for COVID. But when I saw this, my first thought was, we use inactivated vaccines for influenza and we have done for 50 years. And if this is a typical response in an inactivated vaccine, actually for influenza, it's a moderate uh, antibody response, which gives us maybe 50%, 60% effectiveness in a good year. What about mRNA vaccines for, COVID, uh, for, for influenza? I think that I'm sure that the companies are working on it. I'm sure it's not going to be easy but that could be a fantastic opportunity to have much more effective flu vaccines if it works out. Um, and it's not only the, the initial response that's much better, this is data with, with surrogate virus neutralization titers in, uh, in another one of my studies. The people who receive Sinovac on the left start from a, a fairly moderate titer, I would say, and come down very quickly. The protection's mostly gone within three months uh, of, of the second dose, at least in terms of the antibody titers. The, the other response, the T-cell response is still there. Uh, whereas on the right-hand side, the, the mRNA vaccine gives much longer lasting uh, an antibody levels uh, by the surrogate neutralization assay. And so I think that that's really a exciting opportunity for influenza. So my last slide, I think we're, we're now in a much better position with the experiences from COVID to plan an efficient response to the next a pandemic, whether it's influenza or coronavirus or something else. That doesn't mean we're ready. Of course, there's a lot to be done. And one of my uh, tasks on my horizon is to go back to those World Health Organization guidelines and revisit all of the evidence in the light of the COVID pandemic. Uh, I'm not going to do it now. I think there's still a lot of observations to be gathered of, of what's been happening. And of course, the COVID pandemic is not over. So there's still more data to collect. But uh, I, th I think we have a lot of a lot more information uh, now than we did two years ago. And I think we can do a better job with the future pandemic plans. And the specific point I made at the beginning was that I think containment is back on the cards. It's back in play uh, for pandemic influenza. And we maybe didn't realize that until the experience with the COVID pandemic. And then my last point, maybe the last take home message, uh, we, a lot of us have in mind that, that when the pandemic's over, we can kind of relax. But I, I just remind you, sorry, that seasonal influenza epidemics can have substantial health impact. And I think the same is going to apply to, to COVID. I think that uh, we've seen a lot of health impact of COVID in the, in the past year, much of it mitigated by public health measures. Now we have vaccines and antivirals available, but I don't think it's the end for COVID. I think we're still going to have substantial COVID epidemics in the coming years, um, but uh, not sure how it's going to play out. But I'm, I'm just wary that that the story for COVID may not be over when we think it's over. And with that, I will finish and hand back uh, to the other Ben for Q&A. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, I'm going to start just with a few broad questions. Um, just, uh, I think people will be very interested to hear your responses. And there's also been some very specific questions. But um, you did say that you've had you know, six months of no um, COVID transmission or cases in Hong Kong apart from in quarantine. I just wanted to ask about the the ability to travel freely within China, um, uh, is, 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 is that at least internally, is there freedom to move and is Hong Kong, are there any border restrictions that apply to, to Hong Kong and how do you see this play out in the, in the longer term? So in, in mainland China, they're pursuing very aggressive zero COVID strategy where they have the strict uh, border controls, I think, Visitors are still not allowed into China. Even, even foreign students are not allowed back into, into China at the moment. Returning residents have to do quarantine, I think 14 days in a hotel and then seven days at home. Uh, and there's not many spaces for people to go back into the country. And so they haven't had too many outbreaks in the last year. They've had some, it's not zero, they've had some outbreaks, uh, but they're very aggressive in, in containing those outbreaks. Uh, much, much better than I would say uh, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, and Hong Kong had, had managed. Uh, 
with with uh, with our zero COVID approaches. So in the mainland, domestically, is is still possible to travel from one province to another, but in the recent outbreak, they did put a lot of restrictions in place and you have to have PCR testing before you cross provincial borders and so on. Uh, and of course, they have a tracking app where they can track where everybody goes all the time. So that gives them a lot of uh, information that they can use. If there is an outbreak in one particular part of the country, they can really focus on people that have been to that area. In Hong Kong, we don't have an open border with the mainland. We have been COVID free for six months, no COVID outbreaks for six months. Um, the government here is hoping to establish quarantine free travel across the border. So we'll, uh, we'll be able to go backwards and forwards because a lot of people used to do that before the, the, pan, before the pandemic. We have seven and a half million people in Hong Kong and I think 300,000 people used to cross the border every day with mainland China before COVID and now it's, it's a trickle. So that's, that's something that's, that's hoped for. But at the same time in Hong Kong, I think we're, we're wondering how long we're gonna have the zero COVID strategy in place. In Australia and New Zealand, I know you, I think you saw it as a, as a optimal strategy in the short term until vaccines antivirals were available. In, in mainland China, the government, at least from the official statement seems to have, have been very strong about how zero COVID is, is, a, is a really good long-term strategy, not only a short-term strategy. I don't know what are all the considerations in that decision, but they have now have 85% vaccine coverage in the mainland with two doses. They're doing a third dose program. The vaccine goes from age three all the way up to, to the elderly. Um, it's a fantastic vaccine program, fantastically high vaccine coverage. And I, I think if they wanted to, they could consider transitioning away, but uh, they're, they're very keen to keep COVID out of China. And so in Hong Kong, because we're so closely tied, uh, we may also follow, which means we'll have the same kind of travel measures in place. Thanks, Ben. That, that's interesting to hear about uh, the vaccination in three and up um, that's already been rolled out in China. Um, uh, just moving on to flu, um, do you believe that certain flu lineages like the, the type B Yang Yamangata strain uh, may have gone extinct? And there, there, there's evidence that there's no circulating Yamagata no, lineage strains at the moment. And, and what does that mean, you think, for future control paradigms and vaccination? Yeah, it's fantastic. So, so for influenza, we've had for, for recent years, uh, in many parts of the world, we've had a quadrivalent vaccine. So that's with H1N1, H3N2, B Victoria and B Yamagata. There's two B lineages. And one of those two B lineages seems like it might have gone extinct. I would say not confirmed, but it, it looks like it might have. There, there haven't been, been, been much in the way of B. Yamagata detections um, in, in the past year. If that's the case, then, then actually we can look back at the trivalent vaccines. The, the, the fourth B strain, uh, the, the, the second B lineage may not be needed for now. Um, and I, I think it's exciting that, that one of those lineages may have, may have been eliminated. Um, but we, in terms of the annual burden of flu, I don't think that will have an enormous effect because we still have the others. And so that's one less strain uh, around, but still, still three nasty ones to deal with. Um, but it is fascinating that that may have happened. And uh, then just to ask about your thoughts on um, what the, the new mRNA technology will mean for flu vaccination, whether um, mRNA flu vaccines is a, a, a real prospect and uh, whether you see future boosters potentially including COVID and influenza in an annual fashion. What, what's your sense yeah, of no, that? I, I think mRNA vaccines for flu must be, you know, really must be explored. I'm sure the companies are doing that because before COVID, flu vaccines were actually the most used vaccines in the world. 500 million doses of flu vaccine administered per year. That's more than any childhood vaccine. And so there's a massive uh, opportunity for mRNA vaccines to improve existing inactivated technologies and the advantages of mRNA vaccine is not only uh, the, the uh, improved effectiveness potentially, but also the speed because you can program in the formula for the mRNA. You, you don't need to worry about air gap adaptations that have been such a problem with, with flu vaccines in recent years, the mismatch because the, the virus that grows in eggs isn't the same as the virus that's out in the wild and so on. And also the, the timing. So, so we have a six month lead time. We decide the flu vaccine strains but for the Southern Hemisphere of Australia, I think it's towards the end of the year because it takes six months for them to be produced and then available for you when you need them in the autumn. 
And so mRNA technology has the potential to, to do things much faster mm. because you can, you, depending on the manufacturing capacity, you could do it with a much shorter lead time. Um, and then there's a question about transmission. You've, you've talked quite a bit about uh, the potential for asymptomatic transmission early before um, symptoms, symptom onset. But there's, there's two questions related to that. Um, um, do you believe that we um, may be getting a, a significant under um, assessment of the prevalence of COVID if we only test symptomatic individuals? And the second one is, uh, what is your sense on the, um, the duration of infectiousness? Um, and uh, do we have any data on how infectious people remain seven, 14 days after infection if they may still test PCR positive? Yeah, so that, that really important issues. I think with asymptomatic, what, what I think is really important to distinguish is two different types of people. One type of uh, infected person is the person who got infected, they start shedding the virus before their symptoms appear and up to quite a high level of virus shedding and then their symptoms appear, can be mild symptoms, uh, but the symptoms appear and then they continue being contagious for, for maybe a short time and they can spread the virus before their symptoms appear. So that's transmission at the time they're asymptomatic, but strictly speaking is pre-symptomatic transmission. There's a separate group of people that never seem to have any symptoms and the viral loads tend to be a bit lower from my observation. And those people who remain asymptomatic, I don't think it's clear how important they are to the epidemiology and to the transmission. I think it's an unanswered question. My suspicion is maybe not so important as the pre-symptomatics, but of course, when a person doesn't have symptoms and shedding virus, you don't know if they're gonna stay asymptomatic or if they're gonna become symptomatic. So that means there is still some transmission going on before people's symptoms have, have at least for, have fully appeared. And I, I think that's a, a major scientific question, not only for COVID, but also for influenza that I think we need to look at. In terms of the duration of contagiousness, I have a maybe an idea that the duration is not that long. Um, so when we look in Hong Kong at the people who've spread infection a lot, they tend to have done that over a relatively short space of time. We don't have people who are going, you know, Monday they go here, Tuesday there, Wednesday another place, Thursday, Friday, and there's a, you know, there, there's an enormous number of cases left in their wake that mm -hmm. everywhere they went. Uh, it seems like, you know, Monday there was nothing. Tuesday, the places they went, there was a big outbreak. Wednesday, maybe a bit, and then Thursday, Friday is nothing again. And so it, it seems to me like the contagiousness may not last for that long, which it's kind of interesting as well because we know the shedding by, by, by measured by PCR can last for a long time. And in Hong Kong, we have a, a new policy that if someone tests PCR positive, they have to be isolated for at least 24 days, which, which is a long time. Mm -hmm. And you know, some people that test PCR positive, it's really, you know, they're just PCR positive for a few days, minimal symptoms, certainly not contagious after, after those few days when they start testing PCR negative. But in Hong Kong, we have a policy where they'll be isolated very strictly for at least 24 days. Thanks, Ben. Uh, obviously, so many things to explore. Uh, just touching yeah. on, on uh, masks, <laughs> which is always controversial, but um, the, the one question is if, if we believe that there's a significant aerosol component um, to transmission, why do we think the effects of masks are so limited? And, and, and the difficulty of designing randomized controlled trials in this space where there's huge risk of contamination um, between mask wearing and non-mask wearing individuals. So you really need um, uh, cluster randomized trials that involve huge populations to assess it in a controlled fashion. What's your sense about the optimal design? I agree with you. And this is a paper that, that we published in uh, a year ago in Nature Medicine. So aerosols are, we, we think are important in transmission, but we showed that, that masks can block virus-laden aerosols. I mean, not, not 100%. For influenza, you can see here there's some slipping through. But uh, an, another study published by Don Milton in, in POS Pathogens showed there's still a significant reduction, I think a fourfold reduction in, in aerosols blocked by surgical masks. So even with aerosol transmission being dominant, um, there's, there's still a role for face masks to play, but we just can't expect them to be perfect. And I think the other part of your question is, is what I mentioned about What's the, the question that we're really asking? 
Is it the question of mechanistically how perfect can a mask be? You know, if, if you and me wear it when we go into a room with a COVID patient, what's the degree of protection we can expect in that exposure event? That's a different question to saying, if we ask everybody in Sydney to wear a mask, some of them do it, some of them don't do it. And even the ones that do it don't always do it properly. What, what's the consequence of that in terms of reducing the reproductive number in Sydney? And my guess for the first is that is very effective. Uh, I, I would not say 100%, but I would say, you know, th there's a really good level of protection from a, a well-worn surgical mask. But set for the second question about Sydney, if you ask everybody to wear masks, you, you've got to remember that there's a lot of transmission in mask off settings, in homes, in restaurants where people eat, in some workplaces where people don't wear masks, and then the compliance won't be perfect. So you can't expect an enormous impact of face masks in the community, even if at the individual level they're, they're reasonably effective. And I think we've we got to address each of these issues. We've got to address the mechanistic effects, but we've also got to you know, address the, the, the population level yeah. impact of, of mask strategies and mask policies with varying levels of compliance. Um, and I think that's a, a fascinating area for further research. Thanks. Um, ben, you, you mentioned that, um, that schools, uh, we know that flu transmits in schools um, more so than at least the initial COVID signal, um, mm -hmm. and that um, you know, maybe COVID will, will, will change the way we think about flu control into the future. So what do you think may be uh, school-based strategies that um, would be considered um, may, maybe in an ongoing fashion now um, uh, to contain flu um, outbreaks in the future? Sure. So, so for flu-based measures, what I envisage is that in the next few years, maybe we take this chance to look at what are the options and test them out. And then let's say in five years time, we can have a really concrete set of recommendations to schools to say, you know, normally schools just go, you know, just do your normal stuff. But if there's a flu outbreak in the community and the, and the, the mayor of Sydney or the governor, or whatever says, uh, you know, it's time to activate the plan because there's a lot of flu about, then we, we bring into play the, the school measures. And that may be universal masking in schools. It may be lunch has to be outdoors. It may be you have to have more spacing in the classroom. I think it's worth testing out things like the upper room ultraviolet or, or the UVC technologies. Um, it's worth testing out, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, uh, the, the, the boxes in rooms, sorry, I lost the word. Yeah. Uh, the disinfectant boxes, the um, air purifiers, sorry, air purifiers. I mean, I, I suspect they won't do, do, do much, but. I think there's a lot of strategies that can be tested out, but the first part of that process is to go to schools and say, you know, based on the COVID experiences, what's actually feasible? Because I don't think we can we can talk about long-term school closures, but some of the measures may actually be feasible. Universal masking in schools for a month of the flu season, not not the new normal, but for a month of the flu season in a severe flu season, I think is a, is, is something that's that's feasible and doable. So the, the question is how well would it work? And that's what we need to test out. Um, on, on, on that um, point, uh, uh, do you know, you know, can you provide a bit more detail about the, uh, the transmissibility of flu in different age groups in, in kids? What do we know about who, who are the most infectious kids or the age groups that we should most be most concerned about for flu transmission? For flu, I, it seems to me it's more primary school children than secondary school children. So it's children between the ages of five to 11. And if there's a lot of kindergarten, if, if the, in a particular place, a lot of children go to, to, to kindergarten or childcare, then, then that, that would be another, another location where there's a lot of transmission occurring. Uh, in terms of the, the transmissibility, I don't think that's clear. And I also have a question about super spreading, particularly in schools and kindergartens. I would propose a hypothesis that a lot of school transmission is from a minority of infected children who maybe are contagious for longer and at higher levels. And, and so, you know, if we can work that out, that may, may be particularly advantageous when we think about control strategies. But I, I think there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of unknowns. Thanks. Um, just coming to the, the immunization response where you've showed blunting um, in those who had repeat 
vaccination exposure for flu. Yeah. Um, does that blunted immune response correlate with reduced protection against disease or is, is it just an immune correlate that's no well that, that that's exactly what one of my research questions right now i think it does correlate with reduced protection against infection um but obviously with repeated vaccination you you still have that protection against the severe disease um but but it, to me it's it, it's a big question it you know what to what extent is this phenomenon important to to vaccine policy uh, because we recommend a lot of people to get annual flu vaccination every year and it, it we do observe these blunted reduced responses which which mean we're not getting it in my opinion we're not getting as much value from flu vaccination programs as we might have imagined as we might have expected if we have in mind that the flu vaccine gives us 50 60 percent reduction in, in in infections that's true for for well-controlled uh maybe the, the first time sorry that's true for the vaccine programs in relatively unvaccinated people but yeah. uh in in repeat vaccination programs i wonder whether the actual impact is relatively lower mm -hmm. moving on to COVID vaccines um do you think that the strategy in china um will include um, boosting with a more effective potentially mRNA vaccine, or is that a politically sensitive issue? Are they working on their own mRNA vaccines before they will consider that as a boost? But clearly, the current vaccines that they have seem to have moderate and short non-durable responses. So is there talk that you're aware of, of, of boosting with an alternative vaccine? No, you're right. And I can show one slide where in... Uh, if I can, yeah. One slide where in the mainland they've been looking at third doses with inactivated vaccines. Um, so this is a preprint from PAN in Med Archive, where the second dose, the first two doses on the left hand side, is pretty similar to what we found in, in, in the study I showed in Hong Kong with pretty low to moderate levels of antibody titers after the second dose. Mm -hmm. But after the third dose of the inactivated vaccine six months later, it gets to a much higher level, much higher antibody titer which is good news already just for third doses with inactivated vaccines. Um, and so that's what they're doing right now. They, they of course, have the, the Pfizer vaccine. They have the opportunity because Fos and Pharma, mainland company, were the first investor to BioNTech before Pfizer. And so they, they have the, the, the potential to distribute the BioNTech vaccine to the mainland market, but it's not approved yet. It's not mm. approved for the use in the mainland. It may well be soon, but it's not yet approved. And I know in the mainland, they're also working on their domestic mRNA vaccine. Uh, I think they are doing a phase three trial at the moment, but I haven't heard any more than that. And uh, if it works, I think they will switch to using mRNA third doses because we can imagine that the response would be even better. And it, it, there's a, a possibility that China in a year's time could come out of zero COVID after a round of third doses or even fourth doses and have such a high level of population immunity that unlike the rest of the world, they don't even have a substantial exit wave. I think in Australia, you, you know you're going to have an exit wave. Right. In mainland China, if they hang in for another year or two and can get third and fourth doses with these stronger vaccines, I, it's possible, but we have to see what happens. It's also possible that that, uh, that there'll be another variant or there'll be something else that, that means that doesn't work out. But uh, it's certainly a, theoretically a possibility. And just to be a bit more controversial, what are your thoughts on vaccine passports? And um, given the data that we have, do you think it's um, uh, fair to say that three doses of an inactivated vaccine should, <laughs> should count yeah. as equivalent to two so, doses of another? Yeah, so I. I I have personal views on this, which may not be the same as everybody else. I think in, in, in a transition phase away from public health measures is really, really important for community to get vaccine coverage as high as possible. Every percentage point increase in vaccine coverage is a whole load of people that are, that are saved from being hospitalized or even dying from COVID. And I, I would say that there's a lot of government measures that can be justified in the greater good to get that vaccine coverage as high as possible. And so I, I would support vaccine passports in Israel, in other parts of the world, 
as part of that vaccine program to get the coverage as high as possible. What I'm concerned about is the vaccine passports are going to stay. And I'm actually not, not, not that keen on the policy in Hong Kong right now, where we say, if you're coming to Hong Kong from a, another part of the world where there's a lot of COVID, like the United Kingdom, United States, you can only come if you've been fully vaccinated. And I think that's, I, I don't know, if it's the early stage of the vaccine program where we want to get coverage as high as possible, I can see the justification. But if this policy is here to stay, the unvaccinated people are just not allowed to come, I, I, I don't fully understand the rationale into the future. I think it's, it's, it's justified maybe in the short term, but I hope that these are not things that are here to stay. And as you mentioned, there's going to be complexities because I got my second dose six months ago. My protection is going to be pretty low by now compared to someone who just got their two doses. So why do I count? I've got a friend in, in the United Kingdom who had COVID twice and doesn't want to get vaccinated. And my opinion, their immunity might be as good as mine. So why do we say that person can't come, but I can? You know, I, I think there's, and when we have third doses, how is it going to change? What are we going to say about, you know, who's fully vaccinated? Is it someone who's had uh, at least two doses with the most recent within six months? It's different for inactivated vaccines, as you mentioned, because the protection is lower. We're going to have a checklist with so many kind of different alternatives and different options. It seems to me like it's something that we should hopefully be able to do away with. But we have to get through this exit waves first. It, not, not now, but yep. I, I hope they're not here for too much longer. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I think we have to wrap up, but that's a very good note to end up on. And I think we, we all agree that getting vaccination rates as high as possible hopefully will allow us to, um, to exit safely. Um, yeah. I, I see that Joel Nagan has joined us. So, um, Joel, I, I would be happy to hand over to you to just um, say the final thanks if you are happy to do so. Otherwise, I, I can do that. But I'll be, it will be good to have a word from public health um, in conclusion. Great. Oh, I'm very sorry to have joined late, Ben. I'm uh, a bit embarrassed to have jumped in at this late uh, session. It's a bit of a bit of a day, um, but um, I've been chatting to to Tanya and to to Ben um, over the last few weeks as this was coming up, and it's something that's really obviously important to our university, and everyone is really very much looking forward to it. Uh, and so, on behalf of the Sydney Institute for Infectious Diseases and the School of Public Health, and I think the university more broadly. Um, thank you for joining us and for spending time with us uh, and for presenting. Uh, it's an important uh, opportunity for all of us to hear about your work, um, which is really uh, cutting edge um, in the fields of epidemiology and obviously COVID itself. But um, you know, remembering um, that COVID is the new thing that we're all talking about, but a lot of the, the tools and methods and approaches and ideas have, have been around for a very long time. So. Um, thanks very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks, Joel. And Tanya, if you've got a final word in closing. No, I'd, I'd just like to endorse what Joel has said and uh, also thank the audience for their questions and participation. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Distinguished Lecture next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben.